criterion, and I can make the corrections to the uh, when you have a zero in the left hand column, but you have other values because there is a different technique to that, and then I can upload that and add it on here. So slide, I believe 10 and 20 will uh, need corrections. So <laughs> any questions before I get started? Oh. All right. Um, I'm going to try and work through lecture nine really quick too. That way I can make sure anybody who had missed the uh, video from last <coughs> week is up to date, but I'm going to probably move through this pretty quickly. So we're discussing stability. So it's a very important specification, uh, an unstable closed loop, it's pretty uh, useless but an unstable open loop can be stabilized. Um, so there's multiple definitions of stability, but when we're considering our uh, linear time invariant systems like we're doing in this class, uh, these definitions actually come out to be the same. So there's bounded input, bounded output stability, which means any bounded input can generate a bounded output with initial conditions set to zero and asymptotic stability is any initial conditions generates a y of t that converges down to zero. It turns out when it's linear time invariant, uh, those definitions are the same, or both satisfied. So uh, this is kind of a nice little refresher from the uh, uh, time analysis. So some terminologies here. When we have a zero, that is the roots of the numerator of our transfer function, and poles are the roots of the denominator. So we consider our uh, denominator the characteristic polynomial, and we call our characteristic equation when the polynomial in the denominator is equal to zero. And again, this is a repeat saying that's for our linear time invariant systems, uh, bounded input, bounded output stability, and asymptotic stability are both satisfied when all the poles are in the open left half plane. Uh, if you want to like, go through this slide seven, do so at your leisure there. It's just kind of a proof that asymptotic <coughs> and bounded input, bounded output stability are both satisfied for our linear time invariant systems. And this is a repeat of what I've just been saying. Bounded input and asymptotic are different in a general system, but for linear time invariant, they these have to be the same. So refresher on uh, time invariant or time invariant in this case systems. So for a time in, for a time varying system for time invariant system, whenever there's a, a shift in time, there's a similar shift in the uh, output. So it is not time dependent. So getting to some of the ideas of stability, marginal stability and instability. So a a uh, system can be determined or called marginally stable if there's no pole in the open right half plane, that's given, can have at least one simple pole on the j omega axis, and it does not have any multiple poles. So if there are repeats, like right here, you can see that's, uh, that would be plus minus square root of two, uh, twice there, so. Redraw this. I think I have this already in my notes. But I'll redraw it now and I can actually showcase it. So for that example, we had two roots at plus minus j over 2. That'd be approximately here and here. But since that uh, entire function is squared, we have multiple <coughs> roots here and here. 
which means this would not be marginally stable. If we just had the roots here, there's a pair of complex roots, but there's only one pair, that would be considered marginally stable. Is that pretty clear? But um, an unstable system is neither stable nor marginally stable. So this one we would consider unstable because of the multiple roots on the J omega axis. But this one is marginally stable, which means we could stabilize this with a feedback loop. Um, in, uh, for any bounded input, except for some special sinusoidal bounded inputs, the output is bounded um, in these marginally stable conditions. For any non-zero initial condition, the output neither converges to zero nor diverges. So here we have a good summary. Uh, letting S sub I be the poles of the transfer function. So then, transfer function is bounded input and asymptotically stable if all the real parts are less than zero for all uh, poles. Marginally stable if the real part is less than or equal to zero for all i, and there can only be a simple pole for the real part of s of i equals zero. So this should probably add in here too, there can't be any repeated roots, something like that. But still applies. And the unstable condition is if e neither stable nor marginally stable conditions apply, aka we have something in the real uh, right half plane, or we have multiple uh, roots on the J omega axis. So for the marginally stable, yes. what you're saying is the real part has to be less than zero, but it can be zero if there's no imaginary part? It can be zero, so we can have it right at the origin. Yeah. Yes. As long as there's no imaginary. It, there can also be um, there can also be imaginary components like a complex oh, pair yeah. also at the zero part. Okay. But if there's repeats of those imaginaries right. or there's a repeat at the uh, at the origin. So if we happen to have, I guess that would just be a one over s squared. <coughs> would not be a, so something that's one over s, there'd be a simple pull at zero. Um, but if it's one over s squared plus some other terms, uh, that would be multiple at the origin, which would not make it marginally stable anymore. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, I went through some of these examples pretty quickly previously, but what do we think? Is this one stable? And just I'll do it that way. Not stable. Not stable. Not stable. How about this guy? Unstable. We've got right here. Uh, what about this uh, this guy? Factor that s out. That should make it stable because we do have a. We factor the s out. We have uh, pull at zero, and then s plus b, meaning. S is probably negative B, whatever B value is, giving this in the left half plane. So we have the left half and one simple pole at the origin. Um, how about this guy? That one. Yeah. Yes, by the rules there, it kind of depends on if B or K happen to be negative. We're assuming positive there, but uh, this would be considered stable also. That does depend on the K value. Um, going to run through these again really quickly, but uh, we cover this in the video. What do we think about system one? Did you post the, the answer of those or no? Uh, no, I didn't post the answers to these directly, but okay. I did discuss them in the uh, video. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, but I don't believe, let's see what I put it again. Uh, no, I don't believe I actually posted whether each of these are stable, marginally stable, or unstable. 
Um, but I think I heard someone say, yes, we are stable here. Each of these, negative one, negative two, negative three, that's a stable system. Um, number two, what do we think? Yeah, unstable. Obviously we have a hole in the right half plane. How about number three? That would be correct, because this one would be uh, plus or minus square root of uh, j, or plus or minus j square root of three. Um, but this one's negative five, so yep, we're good here. How about number four? That's unstable. We do have uh, multiple uh, roots on the j omega axis, or repeated roots on the j omega axis there. And what do we think about this last one? I'd say it probably is, but we none of the rules that we've covered so far should be able to answer that, which is where we turn to the Ruth Hurwitz method. So we have a few criterion for using this. This has to be a linear time invariant system with a polynomial denominator. So we can't have any sine, cosine, exponentials in our denominator. It'll determine if all the roots of the, of the polynomial lie in the open left half plane or equivalently, equivalently have any negative real part. Also determines the number of roots in, of the polynomial in the open right half plane, but it does not compute what those roots are. So it would tell you how many, uh, tell you whether or not uh, roots are in the left half or right half plane, but won't answer what those roots are. It's gonna be used uh, rather quickly to uh, manually determine if your system is stable or not. But when there's an added note, there's no proof provided in any control textbook that Dr. Timursky has found. Um, I was able to go back into the book and correct the issue that I was having on Friday with his slides to find that, but still didn't see any actual proof there. So, getting into this method a little bit more, we can consider any polynomial has the form uh, Q of S, A sub N, S to the N power, plus A sub N minus one, S to the N minus one, all the way down to uh, S and S zero powers. So we're assuming that uh, a sub zero is not equal to zero. If this assumption does not hold, Q can be factored as S to the M, all multiplied by uh, S to the N minus M, giving us a nice uh, linear algebraic equation <coughs> where a, the average of A is not equal to zero, the following method applies to the polynomial. So this basic Ruth array, again, this might be easier to uh, I'll get to it when I get to draw it out. So we have this Ruth array. So in this top row, we have all, I like to refer to it as the even powers, uh, at least as a rough start, but uh, depending on whether your um, first term is an even or odd, uh, would determine whether this is even or odd. So I guess that's not a fair way to think, that's just how I think of it. But as you proceed, so let's say this is uh, S to the fourth. So the coefficient of the S to the fourth term would go here. The coefficient of S squared term would go here. And S to the zero power, or the coefficient at the end, would go here. And so on and so forth if this was a larger array, uh, or larger polynomial, I should say. Then we would take the uh, for that partial example I gave, s cubed term, coefficient of the s cubed term, coefficient of the s, uh, the first power term, and then this one would be left as a zero. But we'll get into a little bit more of that. But that's how you construct just these top two rows from your original polynomial. Does that roughly make sense right now? We'll get into a few more examples. There's a lot of examples here, which is, I was unfortunate to say that when I took that had the Friday course on Zoom, would have, would have probably been a lot better to ha if I had some kind of dot cam so I could kind of work through those examples with you guys, which is also why I want to refresh all this today too. But 
From there, we can form the rest of these arrays from this first two. And we'll get into some, uh, you know, this is actually getting right into how to compute the third row. So when computing the next row, we take the values that we have in the, from these coefficients and make a, a, I can't remember the term for it because I haven't had linear algebra in so long, but we were basically doing some linear algebra on this where we cross multiply, or not really cross multiply, we're crossing the a to the n minus two term with this a to the n minus one. This is what I called in the video, I also called it uh, determining, well, what did I call it? <clears throat> Just a term that I like to use for it. Um, determining denominator value. Um, I'll have to remember that. But this is what you put into the denominator on each of these calculations. So we're using the term here, uh, the coefficient term here, as our uh, denominator in all of our calculations to build out this row. As we progress down, we'll be using the next coefficient to build the next row, but that'll always be the determining uh, division uh, right there, so this column. But getting back into it, so this first B1, we're calculating use AN minus two times AN minus one, subtracted from AN times AN minus three, all divided by AN minus one. That's to solve B1. Now for B2, we're crossing AN minus four with AN minus one, subtracting that from AN times AN minus five, okay. again, all over AN minus one. You get the general structure for that. As we get to B3, we're using AN minus six, crossing over here, AN to AN minus seven, again, all divided by AN minus one, until we run out of uh, values. And we continue down, let's see, getting into the fourth row. Again, this is repeating what we did before, only this time we're using B1 as the determining denominator. Again, that's my choice of term there. Um, but multiplying here, you can see AN minus three times B1, AN minus one times B2, all over B1. And then for C2, repeating that with AN minus five, B1, AN minus one, B3, all over B1. That's the general formula for most cases. We will get into some of the special cases and I'll be able to correct the one special case where we have a zero and uh, not all zeros in a row. But getting once we have this factored down uh, to a complete column, we can determine the number of uh, roots in the open right half plane by seeing how many of these change signs in our first column. So if these are all positive, then we have uh, no sign changes over this whole column, that would mean there's no uh, roots in the open right half plane. If these are all negative, we would know that there's uh, no roots in the open right half plane. But if we end up having uh, one sign change, let's say all these are positive until the last one and that's negative, we'd have one uh, root in the right half plane. And we'll get into some examples that might help with this. Um, but example one, I'm gonna kind of uh, showcase how we built this again. So this is a uh, odd term and it's the highest power. So we put that at the top of our array. And then we use the coefficients here. So the one matches with the, what would be the one here. And the S to the first term, two here, one, two. S squared to be under that, we do uh, coefficient of one here, coefficient of eight, and you can kind of see how we calculate this, two times one minus one times eight, all over one, giving us our negative six here. <coughs> then we can solve this next one uh, pretty easily. Whenever we have uh, an empty space here, we can consider that a zero. So basically you can take this top value 
and pull it down because if you do the calculations, as you can see here, this is gonna be zero. Therefore, these two will cancel out. You're left with what you started with in this uh, top corner here. Excuse me. Yeah. Could you explain one more time why in the raw S3, you put the one in after two, and S2, one, and A. I don't understand that. So yeah. Um, so actually, let me go ahead. I'm going to switch the doc here. Let me write this down real quick. That way, I can maybe draw this out a more visual style. Okay. And I'm going to write in the coefficients here also, just to make it a little more clear. So we're forming our Ruth array, Ruth Hurwitz. Um, so I'm taking the highest power, that'll be my first row. And then, uh, I guess you can say, oh, that's the end. I'm gonna put this over on the side here. And then the next row would be S the end minus one. That's the first two rows. So for this, Take the coefficients here and here, so the odd power coefficients, and we put them in order. This would be the one here, this would be the two here. All these star, okay. and these ones will be x, just to give it designation. So we took these odd powers, so S cubed and S to the first power, and bring those down in order. Now we're going to take this, and I'll do a little dashed line here, and an arrow. Take these X terms and bring them down, and those become the coefficients in the second row. Okay. Did that help a little bit? A little yeah, visual? Yeah. yeah, thank and you. From there we can calculate out there. Yeah, I know I said it a few times during the uh, Friday class, but I feel like this is a very visual um, kind of idea there. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, and moving on to example two. This is kind of a uh, work through this a little bit. We get another example where we're taking, this is uh, to the third root, or third power. So we're taking the one coefficient that would be here, dropping it here. The six coefficient dropping here, since this is the other odd power. I use the even powers to the coefficient three and the coefficient eight, bringing that down. And then we'd solve this one using that uh, it is a general formula to calculate the next one. So this times this, shown right here, minus this times this. Also shown here just without the one, since that becomes eight anyways. But then we have 18 minus eight over three, becomes 10 over three. And then because this is zero, actually let me, She had left the zeros in there. I feel it does explain things a little bit more. And over three, this is eight, this is eight. But if it helps you, you can put that zero at the end uh, to describe things. But uh, I think this was six, I think. Back it up real quick. No, it was three. Doesn't really matter, it's still positive. But just to kind of showcase this again, um, the eight times 10 over three minus three times zero over 10 over three. This is zero over here, which means we don't care about it. 10 over three cancels out, which is why you can consider dropping that down when you have a zero at the end. That's kind of, it up for oh, yes, thank you. Um, 
but does that help? Uh, it, can, it doesn't show the zero there, but you can consider it zero because all rows should be uh, have the same number of terms. But it isn't shown in a lot of examples that he has on here, but I feel like that might be helpful if you consider it zero in the open rows. It helps me think of it that way. I'm automatic, I'm like, if there's nothing here, I put a zero in my mind. But uh, looking back at this uh, array that we have built, we're only concerned now that we've built it in the first column, positive, 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 no changes there, which means we don't have any roots in the open right half plane. And that's kind of shown here when you actually calculate out the roots. You got negative two and negative one half plus or minus two, 15 over two. <clears throat> so here we have our uh, uh, example from slide 14. And I said, oh, we weren't really sure. So we can rebuild this one. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and just work through it. I feel like if I keep working through these, I can help reinforce it. So I'm going to work this one from the start. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we have a fourth order, order term here. Put that there, and then one minus that, or to the power of one less. So we have a one here. I'm going to circle these ones. They're going to be my first row. One, ten, and one. And then put some x's above these ones. That'll be the second row. Circle five, three, and we don't have a term here, so I would make that a zero. So moving down, we need to make our s squared, s to the first, and s to the zero powers. So in this one, I am going to do uh, 10 times 5 minus 1 times 3, all over 5. 50 minus 3, 47 fifths. And then we know from this one, since this will multiply out this zero, or this one, sorry, and come down here. Let's calculate that one. All right, moving on to the next one. Let's just label this one as squared. Label this as first. So now we have 5 times 1 minus. Oops, wrong way. Did that backwards. Three times forty-seven fifths minus five times one over forty-seven fifths. And just like you put in the slot now. Anybody want to calculate that for me? Let's see. That's three one forty-one over five. Minus 25. <coughs> it's 116 47ths. 116 47ths. 116 That'll work. But the main thing we care about is positive. Also, luckily, we're getting close to the end, so we don't have to worry about bringing that back in. I'm going to put the zero there as a reminder. We can once again drop this one down, which means we only care about this in dash lines. Do this column. We've got a positive value, which is probably something that's less easy. Positive, 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 positive. That looks good. That means we have no sign changes and therefore no uh, roots in the open right half plane. Because of all positive? Because they're well, because there's no sign change, I should say technically. Because uh, if they happen to be all negative, there'd be no sign changes also. That would also still be the third of all open left half plane. Okay. All right. Do, do, do. And here's, uh, 
some quick, and this applies mostly to, uh, uh, I'd say mostly to the first and second order. I don't think I'm gonna ask you any that are higher order polynomial to do without using your Horowitz. But if you're looking at a first order polynomial, if all roots are in the left hand, left half plane, then A1 and A0 would have the same sign. If they have opposite signs, that would mean that it most likely has at least one uh, root in the open right half plane. Does that make sense? Is, especially from a first order equation, if they are opposing signs, then you're gonna have one of the values gonna be, a, a S value is gonna be positive, which is gonna put it in the right half plane. Same thing with the second order polynomial. Uh, if a, if the coefficient a2, a1, and a0 have the same sign, then all roots are in the left half plane. That way you can take, make a very quick assessment on first and second order polynomials. Everything, every coefficient having the same sign means that the roots are in the left half plane. Doesn't matter negative or positive. No, if they're, if they're all negative, it's still, it kind of, you can think of it, I like to think of it this way, you can just take a negative one to the outside and you're back to positive, 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 but it would still have the same roots, all just minus, or times negative one coefficient at the end. So the roots would still end up moving into the left half plane. It, does that kind of make sense? I, that's kind of something I do in, in my head on something like negative, negative, negative. Um, wouldn't there be a scenario where, depending on how large a2 and a1 are, if you do follow the Hurwitz formula, could you also get these sign changes even if they were all positive? Depending on how you say if you're using very large numbers there? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we can make an example to break the rule. Especially for first order, it doesn't matter how large you make that, because then you would factor it out, and you'd still make that negative to counter it. Second order. No, because all that would affect the larger values there, as long as it's all positive, would only affect the location of those roots, not whether or not it would be in the, the left half plane or right half plane. It was a good question though, I like that. Um, I might need to research, I mean, there might be a condition that would break it, but, because you know, no matter what you have for A2, you could factor that out and then put the other ones as one over, so then you're back to an S squared, plus plus, you would have to, you could still break that down. And yeah, the, it would still apply uh, for everything that I'm doing in my head right now. Um, but my thought is, it, depending on, you can make A2 as large as possible, factor that out, then you have uh, A1 over A2 and A0 over A2, which would still be positive. Once you factor those out, it'd be a positive and a positive. Um, which means that the S would be negative to cancel each of any of those out to zero. And yes, I do believe that should work for all conditions there. I'm trying to think of one that would break it though. If we had, break this out, find a condition to break it. Say we're making a two, and I'm just going to make it a thousand, decently large. A one, make low, so we'll just make that one. And a two, and also positive. Let's make that two. A zero. Factor out the thousand right away. S squared is one over a thousand. S plus two over a thousand. I don't really want to solve this. 
solve that, but <laughs> oh, what's the formula again? Negative B plus minus square root of four AC over two A. Did I actually just remember that? Um, so if you want to have a calculator and want to solve that, just for the is then AB squared. A2 or A0 is 2. Oh, sorry, that should be A0. Thank you. But I do believe that should hold up. And that's, I mean, that is just a very rough example. Um, but I don't want to derail us too much on that. But I do believe for all conditions that should be satisfied. Um, just in thinking it through, like I said, you can immediately factor out A2, um, leaving you with a more basic, uh, I mean, you don't even have to, because you use the quadratic formula no matter what it is. It just, me trying to make it do it in my head right now. But yes, uh, I do believe first order and second order, as long as all of those roots are all the same, have the same sign, then it would be at all in the left half length. Higher order roots. Um, I didn't find anything with this in A sub K. I was trying to read up and through the book again to see if I can get this, but I wouldn't worry about this as a uh, quick criteria. Anything higher order than first or second order, I'll be asking you to do root for what's. Um, So we can look through this one then. So real quick, uh, what do we think about this first example? Left half plane, all roots? Yeah. Yeah. You can see positive and positive, it's a first order equation. And you can factor out the three really quick, which gives you S plus five over three, um, which means that S is negative five thirds. Um, how about second order equation, second example? Yes. I think we're, we're stable? Yes. Yeah. Um, again, negative 2, negative 5, negative 100. We can say that all roots are in the left half plane. Here's another second order. What do we think about this? No. No. 523, but then we switch to negative 57 and positive 189. Just on quick inspection, no, it's not going to be stable. How about this one? I think. No. Oh, yes. Because I think it's, they can cancel each other if we do calculation. Well, if you break, if you actually do the calculation here, um, you can break this into two halves and consider if one is stable, the other is stable. But you can also multiply that out and see that you end up having cancel, you know, cancel out. That's the fourth minus one. Um, if I did that correctly. Uh, probably have to work it out even further. But you can break this into the smaller chunks there. This is second order. They're not always the same sign here. So this is this part of it would be unstable, no matter yeah. if you factor it back in or not. This one is stable. They all maintain the same. But this would be unstable, so therefore the whole thing would be unstable. Yeah. Yeah. Because once you can factor each of those out, or combine them back in, doesn't matter, that one's going to be unstable. Mm -hmm. And how about this one? No. No, I don't believe so. I think the A to the K is referring to uh, each of the uh, signs individually. So one and 10, same there, but five and negative three do not follow the same sign. Yeah. I would say offhand, that would be unstable. 
All right, got through that hopefully a little bit quicker than that, well, not quicker than I did on Friday, but probably a little more clear. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's go ahead, I mean, it's about that time. Let's take five minutes so we get back together at 5.30.